Welcome back to another episode of Off the Carousel here on the Field of 68, and I am thrilled to be joined today by the newest head coach in the Big 12, Texas Tech's Grant McCaslin. Grant, thanks for being here, man. I appreciate you. Rob, good times, man. Thanks for having me. So you spent the last six seasons at North Texas, obviously. You won a game in the tournament in 2021. You won a pair of Conference USA regular season titles, and this past season, the NIT. Um, I'm sure this is not the first time that a power conference school came calling for you at some point. So why Texas Tech? Why did you make the move to Lubbock? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of great reasons. Um, and I'll touch on a few of them because I could spend this whole time talking about <laughs> it. But, um, you know, our journey started here. Uh, and I say ours because this is a family. My wife and I, my wife played soccer at Texas Tech. And I, my first coaching job was here working for James Dickey as the director of basketball operations. So we got married uh, while we were here and then got fired. They hired Bob Knight and it sent us on a journey. But we ended up back in West Texas at Midland, Midland College uh, coaching there for six seasons. So we spent a majority of our early and all our kids were born in West Texas. So it's weird, you know, because mm -hmm. kind of home is where you start your family, where you are from, uh, being from Texas and having our, our family start here. There's a weird connection to it that honestly is um, genuine. Uh, uh, and so that's kind of the foundation, I think, of, of deciding this is the right spot. But also in the state of Texas, there's not very many places that love basketball. You know this. And mm -hmm. Texas Tech, it is it is unlike any other. And it's on the shoulders of a lot of great people. You know that. I mean, you know, you look at what Coach Dickey did prior to that, Coach Myers, and then Coach Knight, and then uh, Pat, and then Beard, and then Coach Adams. And obviously in the middle of that was a little stint with uh, Coach Gillespie, who I actually played for uh, in college. But it just there's a unique part of west texas and the people here and the love for basketball and i and i genuinely felt like the support and the area it just was literally the perfect time and, and you can't explain it unless you're in it and to be here i, I honestly do think it was the, the lord providing it and ultimately man there's a lot of hope um and we want to compete for national championships and i thought we built our program in north texas with that in mind and that that people took that by surprise but in our first meeting when i met with the team at north texas um back in 2016 or i guess it was 2017 i told them i wanted to compete for a national championship at north texas and some of the guys were laughing i'm serious and and there was two guys that were asleep in this meeting and it only been going on for two minutes so i mean like the part of this journey that you're trying to get people to believe in is like there has to be a great expectation that how you that and then that's going to dictate how you operate every day like this is this is what we're aiming for this is what we're going to do and that part I, I genuinely believe that Texas Tech has the components to put yourself in that position. You got to be able to win your home games. You got to be able to win, um, have a great atmosphere. You got to have a great university and that kind of support. And all those boxes are checked. But really, the heart behind it and the belief in Texas Tech is ultimately what was the difference and just felt like it was the perfect time to do it. Yeah. When uh, I was going to ask you about the fans, it's interesting that you mentioned that because. Uh, Jeff Goodman always talks about how going to a Texas Tech game was one of the craziest environments he's ever been to. Um, I think that the the peak of it was probably, you know, the the Elite Eight, the Final Four run, the couple of years after that, um, when Beard had the thing really, really rolling, where you're packing, what is it, 15,000 people in United Supermarkets Arena. Um, how do you How do you maintain it at that level? Because if you are, like you said, a, a, a school in Texas, right? with a basketball program in a football state, we could just say what it is. How do you, how do you keep that going? How do you keep it at that level? Because you're in the big 12. That is a very good league. And if you're going to win big 12 titles, you have to win your home games because there ain't very many on the road that you're going to get. Yeah. I, you're asking, you're asking the question. That I think we are, and there's a, there's a few things that I think I've got experience doing that are real. OK, and I've been a part of what Coach Drew did and you know what he is. I mean, mm -hmm. dude worked a miracle and there's nothing there's not a greater rebuild in college basketball. One, 
because my senior year in 1999, I was in the Big 12 playing against Texas Tech, and we went 0-16 my senior year. So I saw it when it was like not maybe the 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 depths that coach took it over with after what happened at Baylor, but like I I was there when we were terrible and no one was coming to games. And a big reason was probably I was playing. I played way too many minutes <laughs> my senior year. But but that that part uh, I think of the journey gives you a perspective of like a, like I I'm, I'm not walking into this not knowing what's at stake. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I have a clear perception because of our time of playing basketball in it. And then of going back and being an assistant for coach Drew for five years, when we went to an elite eight and then built that program of players of who it was, what's the formula to get the right team together? What's the staff need to look like? And then worked with Paul Mills and Jerome Tang and go, the list goes on and on John Jacobs and Jared Nunes. And I worked with Alvin Brooks was my assistant when I when I was a head coach at Midland and we won a national championship so like how do you put the staffs together how do you put there's not a component that's not important you know this if you want to win at this level mm -hmm. and so how do you do it at Texas Tech I mean you better win <laughs> that's the that's kind of the the starter of it but it's the people that you do it with every day and and I, I think there's a talent component to it and there's resources here that are unique. And, and I think the, the fan base and, and all that goes into it. And, but really how do you get the right people? And we're in the Womble right now, which is the most beautiful practice facility you've ever seen in your life, but really how you win is how do you get the people in this building connected in a way that wins? And that's what I thought beard did best. Like when he got the people in this building, it was such a tight connected group. And that's what I feel about coach. Like, through the adversity, those guys could get better. And that's what Coach Drew's team always do. They always finish really well. And that's what I think our team's done. You saw it at North Texas last year, and we won the NIT. We went to the NCAA tournament and beat Purdue. Like, we won three conference championships in a row. Like, how do you build it? And I think that's how you do it is you get the right people in the building, and then you do you do things that are very difficult every day in order to win. And um, the resources around it are the way I think that we can do it. But it's going to be all about people. Yeah, the the line in the field of dreams is if you build it, they will come. Well, in college basketball, it's if you win, they will show up, right? Yeah, um, you mentioned you it. mentioned you mentioned Scott, you mentioned Baylor. Um, I know how close anybody that works on Scott's staff is with all of the other people that that work with them. It very much is a family atmosphere on that Baylor uh, coaching staff. You are now in a league where you got to compete against Scott Drew and you got to compete against Jerome Tang. How? How difficult is that for you guys? Because I it's I know you you want to see each other win, but when they're winning, it kind of it comes at your expense now, right? So it, it how how hard is that for you to kind of compartmentalize? Hey, look, I love these guys, but also I want to beat their brains in when we play them. I think you answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there's two parts to this that are real. You know this, man. Um long after all these wins are done, we'll still be, we'll still be really close, you know, and long after we've competed, um, we'll all be really close. Um, but that's what I think brings a lot of joy to is, um, we know that it's more than the wins. And I say that in, in, an, in an all sincerity, and I'm not trying to be goofy about it and corny, but I really do believe that there's a heart that you love people well, and you know that you'll, you'll have a, a, a depth to your friendship and your relationships. It does strain it though. I mean, I'll be honest about that. I mean, there's already been some things that coach and I've gone through and because you're now competing, you know, and, to your point, it does put a strain on it. But I think those things that you do that are tough together and how you come out on the other side of it does strengthen it. So weirdly enough, I think there's even a more closeness to it. And and I'm just going to try to be as authentic as I can, like and, and mm -hmm. as respectful as you can, right? And I do think order is good. So how do you do it in a way that's honest? I found out that you got to communicate more at some level just to make sure that there's clarity. And you know, coach, 
I don't even know how he texts as many people as he does. Like (laughs) he's always connected people. So I think we'll always be connected through coach because he does such a good job. Like he'll send us group texts still with like sermons or he'll Mm -hmm. send us a group text that kind of bring us all together again, even though we'll be all recruiting the same people and, you know, going at each other in this way. But then all of a sudden here's coach sending us all, you know, a, a, a clip of, of a player talking about teamwork, you know, like he's just such a good connector. And I think coach drew will always kind of be the tie that binds us. But when it comes to the competition, man, I think we all know that we'll all be in this together when it's all over with. And um, there's a love and admiration and respect that I think is the foundation, but don't get it twisted when it comes to these games and when it comes to our teams and our programs, we'll do everything we got to do in order to figure out a way to win one. Yeah, the the comparison that I've uh, that I heard that was that was the best is like when you're if you're playing a video game against your little brother, he's always going to be your little brother, but you got to make sure you get those bragging rights and get that win, right? <laughs> you do, man. You do. You're going to walk away with a hug and a depth that you love them, but at the same time, man, when you're in the middle of it, you ain't you're not trying to come up short. Yeah. Um. All right. I want to talk about your uh your your path as a coach because I think that you have a very interesting career arc. Um, you mentioned that you started as the, I think it was the Dobo at Texas Tech, right? Correct. But you've been, you've been literally everywhere else. You were an assistant in the JUCO ranks. You were a head coach in the JUCO ranks. You were a head coach of Division Two. You were a high major assistant. You were a mid major head coach. Um, salaries aside, because I know that impacts a lot of uh, what makes a great job. Where was your favorite place? And I guess the best way to phrase it is like, where, where did you fall in love with coaching? Yeah. Um, Man, dude, uh, uh, we got fired at Texas Tech and I got paid nine thousand dollars my first year here. And um, I basically had to sell a car in order to pay for college because I was getting my master's at the same time. So like you get in you get indoctrinated that money isn't it like really. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you think that maybe you could be a head coach at the division one level someday. It wasn't on my mind. I mean that sincerely like people like was that your dream? I'm like, no, it really wasn't. It was kind of like, how do I just get started in this and how do I become a coach? Like, how do I coach on this team? You know, how do I get to tech? Well, at Northeastern Junior College in Colorado, we, my wife and I, our first job, we couldn't even tell them we were there to be assistant coaches. We had to be the residence hall directors. They're not called mm-hmm. dorms. If you work in residence life, you don't say dorms. That's not, it's residence halls. So we worked at Herbal Chimer Residence Hall, and I was the, the residence hall director. We lived in it. was our first year of marriage. We moved into a dorm, and we were downstairs. And I'm not joking. It was 60 of the greatest students you've ever been around. But they were they were an ag. They were ag students. So they would get up at like four in the morning and go like work, work, like cows, you know, fields. And then they would come in at two in the morning for partying. And like, you know, I mean, there were spit cups everywhere. And there were like, and and we played pool at till two in the morning. And like, I'm telling you, it was like, that's what was coaching was and coaching wasn't, but then I had to go to the event center and open it up at 6 AM to let people in to work out, you know, but then you're up at midnight with students in the residence hall. Like that was, I think that was like what teaches you the love for this, that it is people, right? Because I couldn't even tell them I was an assistant coach, even though I went there to try to be a, the the second assistant at a junior college in Sterling, Colorado, which is like mm-hmm. the Nebraska Wyoming corner. So I think that was just in my mind, it's seared in like, this is what really coaching is. And people think coaching's national TV and, you know, Scott Drew and Jerome Tang. And really what it is, is it's Herbal Chimer Hall in Sterling, Colorado at two in the morning playing <laughs> pool with some students that don't give a crap about basketball, you know? um but well, that's I'll that's the thing about it right it's if you don't love it hmm. you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to grow and like you have to love it you have to love the grind you have to love the process you have to love um making those eight hour drives on the road to go see a kid in a high school gym to try to get him for a division two program right like you have to love that part of it and when you do that's how you will grow and that's how you get to the point where you're um, you know, you're coaching for Scott Drew or you are competing against Jerome Tang in the Big 12 or you're the head coach at Texas Tech. If you don't love it, you're never going to make it. No, and 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 if you don't love the people you're doing it with, then you're screwed. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, really, it's like it's too hard 
to, to do this and not be around people that you love every day. Uh, and the other one probably, and you know, as head coach at Midland Junior College and that journey was amazing. Those people are amazing. It really is kind of like the place that I thought we could have stayed for a really long time. And I tried to, um, and I went in at the time and begged the president, like, can, can we do this? And it was like, we weren't going to do the, the, the bonus structure anymore to keep coaches. So like, I kind of, in my, I went to lunch with my wife right after and she slid a, slid a, a pregnancy test across and we were having our fourth kid. And then at the time, Midwestern State had offered us a job and it was going to pay significantly more. And when we got that pregnancy test, I'm like, four, I can't do on 50,000 ducks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, we got to go. Like, And I was like, I begged the president. I'm like, can you get me to, to 60? And he's like, nope, can't do it. I'm like, dang, dude, I guess we got to go. And that was like how clear it went. But we went from Midland College where we had guys go to Kansas, Tyrone Appleton, Purdue, mm -hmm. Nemanja Chalison. These are the national championship teams. PJ Hill went to Ohio State. Um, I mean, we just had such a great run of guys and we won the national championship. And when you kind of go through those journeys with those guys, they always moved on to another school. You know what I mean? Like it wasn't like your university was it. And our first time of being a part of that as a head coach was Midwestern State. And I'm telling you, I told people this the other day, we played in DL League and Coliseum. And ironically enough, Midwestern State now is a part of the Texas Tech system. Mm -hmm. And that was our first Division II job. And that was the first job where it was like, that was the university these guys graduated from. And we went to the Elite Eight back-to-back -back years. And they hadn't been Division II. They were NAIA prior to that. But they loved hoops. And we played Central Missouri. And my my great friend on their staff who passed away, I love him, Nelson Haggerty, was an assistant. But he was an assistant at Central Missouri the year prior uh, uh, to that. And we played at DL League, and, and that place was packed. They had them wrapped around the building for the regional championship game, fire marshal deal, you know, the whole deal. And it was like the first time that I was at a university where this was their school. You know, like mm -hmm. Chris Hagan was from Rice and Blinn and scored 50 in a college game. Jason ABA uh, had played at TCU as a starting point guard there for two years. He was on our team. We had such a great team of guys, Craig, that – and that was their university. Like they associated with Midwestern State at the end. It wasn't TCU. It wasn't Rice. It was Midwestern State. That was the first time I felt like, yeah, man, like this is our this is our team. This is our program. And that was one of the most fun games I've ever coached in was that regional championship game and a sold out DL League and Coliseum to go to the Elite Eight for the first Elite Eight in the history of uh, Midwestern State's basketball in, in Division Two. That was that was my first time of being like, this is a college. This is what it's like. This is why you do it. These are the students are going crazy and just people everywhere talking about Midwestern state basketball. Yeah, the community aspect of it is something that I don't think that you really get in any other sports in America and outside of like maybe some of the European soccer leagues. Like you just don't see that anywhere else where it's the entire community backing uh, one team and one program. All right. Uh, I do want to ask you about the Big 12 because – um, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Big 12 is a monster. It's the toughest league in America. And oh, by the way, they're adding Houston and Cincinnati and BYU and UCF. Are you are, are you ready for this? Are you ready for what the season's going to be? It's going to be a bear. Yeah, I mean, I, I I hope you understand. We just came out of a league that played in the uh, Final Four, and two teams mm -hmm. played in the championship of the NIT. You know, I mean, like I. Try to play, try to play UAB and FAU. I mean, I asked Hang about it. I mean, he's like, man, that was the most competitive, tough team that we played, and they played some pretty good teams. Mm -hmm. So I, I do think that there's a you you called like the trajectory or whatever the progression of it is, and having been assistant in the Big Twelve, when you know you see it up close, I, I can tell you this: I'm not I'm not confused on what's coming. You know, and now how we do it and what it looks like and what we're capable of doing in regards to getting there. I mean, I, I it's going to be extremely hard. And I love to talk about the future because I'm one of those guys that wakes up with a lot of hope. I don't look at it and go, oh, crap, we're screwed. I mean, I'm like, we can we can figure out a way to do this and we'll get in the trenches. I do feel like we have a formula that can compete. If you look at our last two years uh, at North Texas, 
we had the most road and neutral wins of anybody in the country, us mm-hmm. and U of H. So, I mean, like, if you know this, like, there has to be a grit component to win in championships. And sure. our first year, we won the CBI. We made it to the NCAA tournament. We we won a game in the NCAA tournament. We won a home game in the NIT and lost to Virginia at home uh, in an overtime game. And then the next year, obviously, we won the whole NIT. So, and we went from 25 to 30. So, like, I feel like there's, there's a build to it that that I do have an understanding of what the league is. But you know this. It's way different to go out there and do it. It's another thing to talk about it. And so – but I think those road wins and our competitiveness defensively, I do think that that's got to be the rock foundation of how we do it. Now, how do you figure out how to get the best players in here to have some confidence offensively? And we will open it up here. Um, I felt like the only way we could win a national championship at North Texas was to grind out possessions. I think you still got to have that mentality, but we'll have we'll have talent here that I feel like can take advantage of more offensive opportunities. And you have to, in order to win in the big 12. Yeah. That's what I was going to ask you is you, you played a very distinct style at North Texas and um, you were able to bring the players in that you thought could excel in that style. Whereas now that you're at Texas tech, like you got a roster full of guys that Mark Adams brought in some of them, Chris Beard brought in. Right. So how do you, how do you kind of balance, um, doing what you want to do as a coach with I have to mold what I do to the strengths of the players that I have on the team. Yeah. Well, I mean, thankfully that's kind of what we've done everywhere we've been, you know, that like Mm -hmm. we took over at uh, our uh, Midwestern state, for example, uh, that first year we went 31 and three and we averaged over 80 points a game. Why? Because we had a team that was like really athletic. I mean, we put 10 guys out there and they were better than most teams, 10 guys. Mm-hmm. And that was a majority of them were other other guys that we inherited and 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 Coach Ray at the time did a phenomenal job with the program. And then we took over at Arkansas State in our first year, we won 20 wins, which was the only time in the history of the program they've ever won 20 games in the regular season ever in the history of the school. So that part, I think, is something that my experience has helped me with. You got to do it different ways. And One reason why we went with this distinctive of style was ironically because of Texas Tech. I mean, after our first two years, we won the CBI. We averaged like 90 points in the CBI when we won Mm -hmm. it. And our last game we won was against Matt Mooney at South Dakota. And Matt ends up transferring here and being a part of that run that went to obviously the championship game. But Coach Hodge and I, who took over at North Texas, who's one of my best friends in the world, is like a brother – he he really is an amazing coach. He's won 90% of his games, but a very good defensive coach. So when we watched the national championship game between Virginia and Texas Tech, we said that's the model that we wanted to use. And so, so Ross went and met with Mark and Beard let us have like total access to the program because we'd mm-hmm. coached, coached against Coach Adams. I'd coached against him for five years. So my first head coaching job at 27 at Midland, I'm facing – Mark Adams, who was like, you have no clue. You think his defense was good here. You should have seen it in junior Mm -hmm. college when he had unlimited practice hours. (laughs) (laughs) It was like one time, I think we had like 13 points at the half playing against him. And I like, my brain was scrambled. I mean, I was like 28 years old. And I'm like, dude, this is not going to work. This is how we do it. So um, I do think. I have enough experience on adding guys and winning quickly that you got to, you got to do what fits the team. And then we'll try to mold it into what we feel like fits how we really want to win in the end. And we did, that's, what's good about this is these guys have played that defense and we've installed that. And so we feel comfortable, honestly. And I mean, I look at their practice plans and it mirrors ours in a lot Mm -hmm. of ways, what coach beer did and what Adams did. And like, so it's weirdly all connected. So I don't think there's a huge, like, we got to do it completely different. But I do know that, like, what we're going to do offensively is not going to be the same. You know, it's going to have its own unique components to it. And we've had one of the more efficient uh, scoring offenses. It's just we probably turn the ball over too much. And that's something that I've got to figure out. Uh, Like, we either scored or we turned it over. It felt like that was kind of where we landed. But it was – it, but like our our numbers were crazy. I mean, like we were in the top three every year in our league. And one year we had the best offense in, you know, it was the number five most efficient offense in the country uh, that year that we 
that COVID stopped everything. So I, I do think we've got enough experience to put it all together. Yeah. Well, listen, Grant, I appreciate the time today. Um, I love hearing about guys taking over new programs. And I love guys that that started at the bottom and, and found a way to build it up, man. It's uh it's been fun to watch your journey. It's gonna be fun to watch your Texas Tech team this year. Best of luck to you this season. And I hope that you find some time to get some fishing in as well. You too, brother. Enjoy your day, man. Thanks for having me on and wreck them. Our partner for today's episode is Athletic Greens. I started taking AG1 during the college basketball season, and I loved the impact that it had on my energy levels. I'm a big coffee in the morning guy, but by the time that the afternoon would hit, I needed another boost. AG1 helped me tremendously, especially on those days when I didn't want to get up off the couch and go hit the gym. Their tagline is AG1 is comprehensive health and the power of habit in one. And man, that could not be more true. It's nearly impossible to eat and drink in a healthy manner in the month of February and the month of March when you are in my business. And AG1 was exactly the supplement that I needed to improve my gut health and cover my nutritional basis for the day. I've continued that into April. I've continued that into May, and I'm going to continue that the rest of the summer. All I have to do is mix a scoop of AG1 with some water or maybe add it into a smoothie and I'm ready to go. Do it after lunch and you'll be ready to go for the rest of the day. If a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com backslash field68. That's field68, F-I-E-L-D, the number six, the number eight, and you can get yours now. So check it out and help support this show. Thanks.